Refrigerant overcharge. Always, we will see high pressure suction and discharge. Now, let's say I have an evaporator coil right there. And this is my cap tube metering device. For a refrigerant on the charge, this will start freezing right here you get a frost line. If if I'm overcharged, chances are my frost line would be right here. Okay? And this goes back to the compressor. So I will begin to get a freeze up right back there. So, sometimes when we do window air conditioning unit, there is no way with a window AC that you can actually say for, you know, your condenser saturation temperature calculation based on um, ambient. Because you have discharge air here, you have, you have cold air here. They're mixing. Yeah. So nothing is really going to hold through for a window AC unit. You can charge it visually by this. As you charge and you will notice the frost line here. So that means you're low on charge and you charge until the frost line disappears. Make sure you, at that point you stop. Because if you overcharge now, <coughs> that's gonna be your frost line. begin to frost here now going back to your compressor. And you will get liquid going back to your compressor. This is a no-no. So, if nothing else, capillary tube metering devices gives you a visual indication whether it's on the charge or overcharge. Now, of course, regardless whether it's, um, actually, let me go back and do this thing here. If I'm overcharged, what's going to happen to my superheat here, considering that I have ice build up here? It'll be low, very low. Very low superheat, right? Yeah, my superheat may be next to nothing. Right. All right? See? That's what it says there. So if I have low superheat, I know I'm overcharged, but this applies only to capillary tube system. <coughs> THV, if the valve is good, <coughs> we lose or draw, it's going to maintain, yeah. try it best to maintain at 10 degrees superheat. Stubborn. What you will see here is excessively high head pressure. Now, if I have excessive high head pressure and it, the THV now acts as a restrictor, so Imagine that it's a restriction now that's causing that high head pressure. What do you think will happen to my soft cooling? It's going to be way high. It's going to be way high. You're not going to have any soft cooling. I mean, it's going to be way up there. You're going to have a lot of soft cooling. Yeah, it's going to be way up there. Your condenser is going to fill up with refrigerant. Yeah, you have the concept. And let me explain this whole concept to you so you understand. Because um, this is the same concept we have, they use when you, when you deliberately flood a condenser yeah. to maintain head pressure. Because what's going to happen here, this is, let me use the red, it's going to be more picturesque. See, let's say, If this system is overcharged, what's going to happen? That section will be filled with liquid 
as well as this liquid line going to meter in device, right? Mm -hmm. When I did that, I'm effectively blocking, this is the same thing. If I fill out with liquid, it's the same thing as if I take a piece of board or thing and do that to the coil. I am blocking the coil, so I'm re I've just reduced the amount of surface area I have to cool that refrigerant. So what I'm gonna get, high head pressure, and this is almost to ambient, which is the 95. So I have, instead of 125, I may have 145 minus 95, zero. 55. Where's 50? 50 degrees is 50 super degrees, cool. so cooling. That is ridiculously high. Yeah. It's all sitting in the condenser. Yeah, because everything is sitting in the condenser there. Too much liquid, too much liquid. Too much liquid. Now, let me show you a scenario where I could still have 195, 145 degrees there. Now, imagine this condenser had the right amount of refrigerant, right? But I still take this and block it up. I can go there. So instead of taking this, imagine all the grass from the lawn and all the dust that was floating around and all the lint and what have you got sucked into that coil. coil. And it's effectively blocking the coil to a point where only 50% of the air can pass through. I'm still gonna end up with that, right? Yeah. But my liquid coming out here is not gonna be 95 anymore, it may be 140. Yeah, because it's not, not There's no, none of this hot throughout. So all I'm gonna have in terms of subcooling is about five degrees. So a blocked condenser coil will give me high, high head pressure, pressure, high blows, head pressure like zero subcooling, and an overcharge system will give me the same high head pressure, but very high subcooling. subcooling. So that's the way you can tell the difference and you know what to address. And it's, it's so nice when you can Tell your customers, hey, hold on a minute, right? You see this gauge here, it's reading 500 PSI. Uh, where's your hose, sir? Take the hose, get some of your chemical from your truck. You know, cool down the coil a little, spray your chemical on, allow five, 10 minutes, whatever it says on the bottle. And then spray it off. Not only is it gonna clean all the crap, it's gonna look nice and shiny. You can actually go and press in front of it. Mm -hmm. Put on makeup. <laughs> Customers love that, man. When they see that condenser coil look so nice and shiny, they they tell, I never seen it like that before. Yeah. How much do I owe you for that? <laughs> oh, just give me three hundred and fifty dollars. A normal cleaning is about three hundred fifty bucks, regardless. Yeah. So, good housekeeping for the prevent that. Normal cleaning of condensers, what? About three hundred fifty bucks. I charge that. So when somebody calls you to do a spring start up, that's what you get? Oh no. If I have these people on a contract like that, no, I'm not going to charge because the cleaning will be part of it because it's ongoing. After the force or that initial heavy cleaning, yeah, I'm home practically, I'm making free money subsequently to that force cleaning. You know, so you take a hit on the force cleaning, but you're getting 10 times the amount on the subsequent cleaning. Don't look short a period of time spending there. Yes. yes. All in good spray. Wait 10 oh, minutes, yeah. rinse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Check the filter. Check, check the filter. You spray, you leave it on for what, about 10 minutes? And you watch, watch so all yes. the uh, coming uh, out and you rinse it off? Yeah, yeah, what it does, that liquid goes in between the, the, the fins. fins and it begins to foam. And the foam, you can actually see the foam pushing out everything out of that. And then you wash it in the uh, opposite, opposite to where the air is And you can see the water. And you actually see the water coming out to a black, you could paint a black car with it. Yep. And it'd be black car with it. Black coil. It's also a coil too, right? Yes, yeah, the whole coil. Normally I would pull the fan off at the top. Yeah, yeah. Right. Which is, which is probably screws. just four, four screws. And you lift it and flip it on the um, 
to one side and you get a hose and spray from inside. Of course you get a little bit of wet, but why is that compared to $300? Nothing. That's what I did yesterday. Come on, baby. Uh, That's what I'm going to do right now. Right 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 this uh, industry guy is... Home Depot must be that secluded, right? Yeah, but you know. Uh, just go right here no. to the supply house and go buy a gallon. Do not buy, yeah. do not buy regular degreases. Buy a condenser cleaner because these cleaners are actually designed okay. for that. Because so what they do now... Right, go to each box. All right. What these condenser cleaners are designed to do is not only clean what's there and make the aluminum look shiny, it leaves it's a coating on it. It's okay. like that. Um, you know, for carpet, they have this Scotch guard coating. Right, it doesn't let it stick. That has a coating that it leaves on the fins. So anything goes on it, kind of don't stick that much. Some will stick, but not compared to what it was before, 50% of it will get blown away or drop off when they find the soft work. Or rain. Yeah, or rain depending on your refrigerator. So the, those cleaners are developed specifically for that, and it has rust inhibitors and um, all these effects. And the evaporated yeah. cleaners is a spray can, you <coughs> spray it on, the condensation. Yeah. You know, they're the evaporated cleaners, the one you can clean the inner unit with. You yeah. spray it on, leave it for five minutes, you don't have to rinse. Turn on your system. Yeah. The sweat in it, it's just rinses it when, when you get the sweat in of the coil, it rinses itself off. It's called self rinsing. Yeah, they sell so you, the by directing. It's dripping down to your filter. What? No, it's not going to drip down to your filter. It stays right on the coil. It's going to go in the drain pan. And then you have a pipe that goes outside the house. Yeah, that's right. It's got a pan. Okay. You get a couple of tablets for the pan. Yeah. Um, it's amazing what those cleaners can do. I, do. When I, I deliberately show people when I go clean their coil, I show them what the gauge is, what's the reading. You know, you get high pressure reading and, and you tell them, listen, did you ever clean this? No. Well, you know, that's what this gauge is telling me. Your system will, is willing to work, but you need to clean this. You need to clean just like how you go take a shower, you know? And then you say, okay, I'm gonna clean it and I'll show you the difference. Okay, and you clean it. You show them the difference when you start up. Number one, before you start up, you show them the difference in the looks of it. All right, and show them what, show them the color of the water coming out too. Right? Then when you start up, so now I don't even go, I say, you remember I told you what numbers I want on that gauge? Go take a look. I'm going to go with that. So it's evaporated off cleaner too, then, right? Yes. And they have cleaners. It's very different. Make even with ice the machines. They have the cleaners specifically developed for ice machines. Mm -hmm. Because ice machine evaporators has a, um, a nickel coating. So you don't want to damage that. So they have one where you call it nickel safe. Then you have antibacterial inhibitors and everything. So it is food safe cleaners. You don't want to use regular cleaner in that because you're ultimately going to use the ice. Yes, so all the stuff are developed, they're food safe, and even the cleaners they use for air condition, not that they're food safe, but if they come into incidental contact with you, they're not going to do any significant um, dogs or damage or even to your animals yeah. or the grass or anything. It does not harm your grass, no. you know, because it's not acid base. They're alkali, and if you put alkali in your soil, it, do, it doesn't um, hurt. Sometimes you help the grass grow even greener. Yeah, there's a greener pasture here. It's not yeah. too far. It's Cooper nickel on the ice machine. Now, I could be a um, thing, but a lot of those evaporators on the ice machines are copper, um, not copper, nickel coated. Yeah, but don't they call that Cooper nickel or something? The, the material that is initially made of uh -huh. will be that depends on condition. <coughs> but then they still send that to be coated with, with the nickel on top of it. Nickel on top So inefficient evaporator, of course suction pressure will be lower than normal. Thing is 
if I cannot absorb enough heat, if I don't have enough heat exchange, of course, I will get a low pressure, right? But then what's causing that system not to exchange the heat? Number one, it could be evaporate itself is now um, coated with a thin coat in the door to dust and what have you. Okay? And it, see what it says, the door to your block coil, the defective. So you're not getting the full flow of air across the coil, in other words. So it, it's not exposed to the amount of heat. Yeah, it's not exposed to the amount of load that it needs to be exposed to. Okay. Um, and if you notice, it's either air, actually it's basically it's air problem here that causes an inefficient evaporator. Yeah. Because even a door heat or block coil is restricting airflow. Everything is based on airflow in this industry too, guys. <coughs> so if you go in there and you see you have two fan motors and only one of them is running full speed. The other one, you will see it running if it's not normally gonna run, if it went bad, and, back but back. it will be spinning backwards. Yeah. Classical indication that that's the one that's bad. Anyway, sometime, sometime you're hoping that it's nothing more than a loose wire, but uh, it never is that. So you always have to take it out and change it. They're pretty easy to change anyhow, evaporate a fan. Oh, hell yeah. You know, <coughs> in a freezer, your hand gets stuck to all the metal parts, and they come out there, you have all your fingertips are kind of ripped <coughs> If they're not ripped, they kind of feel like it's red. <coughs> you know? Yeah, because when we used to change them in, the, in that blast freezer, oh, yeah, it was sure. freaking, you know, you, you work with gloves, but you can only they're a little bit tough to work with. The only blast chillers I'm going to work on right now is those portable ones. You know, they have these small yeah, ones yeah, yeah, in the yeah. restaurant. I'm, I stopped working on blast chillers in industrial setting. Not me, I'm too old to shoot now. You know? <laughs> because you got to be absolutely careful working in those negative 40 degrees. Damn. You know, you're going there. You know there's a song that takes my breath away? That one takes your breath away. You know what the song means when you're going to a freezer like that? It takes everything away. You know, we had the freezer suits. We had to have the suits. Yeah. Yeah, you put on a suit, but how much can you cover? No, it was a one, it was like a one-piece suit. You put a hat on, you put gloves on, and you made sure you all your tools were there. Here's the deal. We used to have to go in and change proximity switches and the, the screws. Some of the screws a half the diameter of this, and the nuts are even smaller. When you have gloves that have your fingers separated <laughs> yeah, like this, tell me how you're gonna change a screw and a nut with a small screwdriver. Right, you gotta take your gloves like off. Like this, you gotta take your gloves off. I know. The moment you take your gloves off, your, your fingers frozen like, just like this. You know, you look like Frankenstein walking around. Well, it's cold, there's no doubt. Yeah, no doubt about it. Back to the 40 degrees is cold. So you can take care of this by cleaning the coil, um, change your motor, and I think um, yeah, if your expansion valve is bad, you know you're not going to get your superheat. Okay, so it could be flooding the system, and your super, if it's flooding the system, where's your superheat going to be? I don't know. It's flooding it? Yes. Superheat's going to be low. No. Right. Yeah, you're going to get close to zero. It's going to tend to zero yeah. superheat. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a classical indication of flooding the system. Not, does not necessarily mean the system is overcharged again. It's just that, the just that this is and bad. Uh, and the valve's letting too much liquid in it. Right. Because low superheat is a classical indication of over um, overcharge, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, is the expansion valve that's a problem, and the easiest way to find out is measure the superheat. But the like the the ice going back to the compressor is a good indication. You don't need to measure anything anymore. So you know, one of the things I find is that you go in there and you do a visual check, 
more often than not, you you look you look you can be looking at your problems. Yeah, it, it look it look back right at you. So you don't need all this big instruments and you know going here. You can see if a fan is not running. If there's two fans in there, you can actually if the fans are running, you can actually see it. Look at the back of the coil, and you'll see if it's blocked up. If it's a TXV, you're gonna see ice forming right back there, compressor. So classical indication of that. Uh, same thing with inefficient condenser, high head pressure. And remember the condenser does three things, right? De superheat condenser. Right. Now this, see this word here, condense. Typically, um, you, you can actually substitute the word cool here, right? De superheat, cool and subcool. This two, we accept it to mean the same thing. When it's used with this two. Okay, so guys, if there is a question like that, cool, that flexible, that, that flexibility is there. With now the that would answer, be right? de superheat, cool, and subcool is what you would say, right? Yes. Because you, you cool in order to condense. Right. Yeah. So this is the process, this is the result. <laughs> uh, okay. In that order. In that order. And then, of course, you will get more subcooling in your line set. But refrigeration systems, um, unless you have remote thing, we don't really have that long of a line set to consider, you know, very rare. But um, and just remember though, if you have line sets, please do not, if you're setting up a system, do not route it through a boiler room. Mm -hmm. Serious, I've seen that. You got the refrigeration compressors here, you got the evaporators on the side of that wall, but in between that there's a boiler room. So you pass the two winds through the boiler room. Guess what happens? You get a no. start, you, you, you end up always having a problem with the evaporator section yeah. of the system. But you can't do anything because of the boiler room in between. Mm -hmm. Shut the boiler off. One of the places I told you guys I work at a restaurant, Kellers. Yeah. Yeah. 50% of their refrigerant refrigeration, actually 100% of the compressors are in the basement. Everything in the kitchen, the lines run through the basement, comes up and then go th into the floor, and then go to each one of these units. So, summertime, <coughs> you know, just leave. I always have problem with those units. Either they're they're icing up the condens the evaporator, or they ain't cooling properly. And there's nothing, nothing I can really do about it because the lines are lines are headed to a boiler room that's red hot in the sun. In the winter, it is comfortable. But that's where, that's where you can go hide out, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, high head pressure. And as you approach the critical point, the critical temperature of this, it takes longer and longer to condense that with refrigerant back into liquid. So less of, less of cooling. You get less everything all around if you have high. Yeah. Actually, I just give you the example. So it says here. right there, refrigerant cannot de superheat, yes. cannot condense, and subcool. So we need to re. We uh, establish the flow rate of the cooling medium, which is air or water in most cases. Now, <clears throat> you guys may find this in real life. Actually, you are going to find it in real life. Where the homeowner may call you and say, hey, you know what? It's hot outside. My system is running nonstop. You were working good yesterday. You know, granted, it was like. 75 degrees yesterday, 
today's 90 degree, it's not working good, you know. Go for it. Now, when you go around the house, you follow the lights, yet, or you follow, generally, you follow the noise, right? To locate the condenser unit, mm -hmm. you gotta be jungle gym now. <laughs> you gotta go through all those plants, oh, yeah, like this, and crawl, <coughs> crawl under some, crawl over some, to get yeah. the condenser unit. Yeah. And then when you get to the condenser unit, there are some vines that are hanging right over here. And then some other tree branches that are right up against Stop the house. Over and the the canopy yeah. over the unit. Guys, that restricts your airflow. So all the air comes right off the top and goes around like this. Yeah. It recirculates. So if we have recirculating air, my head pressure is going to stay sky high. Check. You know, if you're unlucky, it's going to trip the, um, the high head pressure switch that they have in there. And by the way, each of them have a high head pressure oh. control, which is oh, it's um, internal, which it? is manual. Oh, it's manual? Yeah. If you look right where the panel that you normally take off, where the contact coil is, yeah. you look right up under there, you're going to see a pink or a blue button. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right. I saw it on a, I saw it on one. Yes, on a friend of mine. It was on it was underneath though. It was in the bottom. Yes. There was a little yes. tiny hole. You gotta know where to look. Yeah, there was a little uh, tiny I hole and it said yeah. And that little button, if you press it, you're gonna hear click, it's a breakup. You're gonna hear click and it resets. That's itself. right, now I recall that. Alright, and that's a high head pressure cut out. So you gotta um clean all of this here. A lot of people don't want to cut down their plants, but you have to tell them here, you know. This thing needs to breathe. Without it breathing, you cannot get the air condition, so it's your choice. Stay hot and uncomfortable and complain to everybody. Or you can cut this down and you don't have to complain to nobody and you're going to be comfortable. Almost fine. Most of those plants are wrong air condition unit. Most of those plants are more or less stationary. Yeah, yeah. You can't move them. Yeah, you can trim them. I mean, yeah, common sense them, would yeah. tell you that. Yeah. 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 yeah, but see, common sense, like you just said, it's never, it's never there when you need, you know. It's not too common, yet. yeah. Oh yeah, it's like perfume. <laughs> yeah, common sense is like perfume, right? The ones who need it most. <laughs> So refrigerant restriction, if we have a partial restriction, we're going to get problems. Um, what you will see is right at the restriction, you begin to see frost lines. If you have a full restriction, of course, your low side will be extra, extra low, and your high side will be extra high. And you'll have ice right? or frost, right? You well, for a full restriction, you ain't going to have nothing frosting up, no place. No. Not just you, getting by. If you have a low pressure cut out, it's going to shut down at low pressure. Because yeah. nothing is getting by. King tubing, one of our biggest problems um, in refrigeration system, especially those little boxes, deli boxes I keep mentioning all the time. Uh, because when you do a service, you have to pull that compressor unit from below. And yeah. These guys, you need to pull it two feet, but they put 18 inches of tubing only. So wow. if you, you're assuming that you have the space and you pull and you end up kinking. Many a time I had to call under there and cut out the king and, and re-brace it. And that sucks because that sucks. You, you have a space about this. Yeah. Right. All right. And to go in there with a torch. And people walking, yeah, you gotta lay down to get in there. Yes, and sometimes the floor in the right. cleanest, you know. Oh, it's yeah. never clean. Never clean. <clears throat> so, wherever we have a restriction, you will have a temperature difference. Um, the walk in box you guys put in, you notice you have two pressure, t pressure um, access valves. Uh -huh. That's to tell you if you have a restriction or if your solenoid isn't opening fully. If you have a pressure differential, no, it means you have a blockage in the solenoid. You will, you can read it, but then a temperature, temperature measurement will tell you 
that you have it. If you have one degree change, you have a restriction. Granted, the system will work without one degree differential for now, right. but it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. Marty Law, right? Yeah, where, where did you say the, the, the valve? I didn't see the valve in there. Yeah, the, it's the liquid, liquid line solenoid? Yeah. Oh, right, 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 on the liquid line solenoid, liquid yes. Line yes. Solenoid. Just two no. The only problem is we have no 404. We can't check this thing. We can't. The Do yourself a favor, and I'm going to see if I tell Mr. Conklin. Is, no, I'm going to tell him, but um, we can use him. We can use him. We can use him. Ninety-nine. Well, but do they have that? Yes. They do. That's a fancy blue can. I was, I was haven't seen any of that. That's a fancy, nice-looking blue can. All right. Um, what I did last, I that I noticed this somebody had leave it on, and it was short cycling, and um, right where you guys had hooked up the low pressure control. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the flare nut was leaking. <laughs> All right, so I took the fear not from there, because the system was empty, and I put it on the suction service valve. There is a port there yeah. that was made to put low pressure control. Yeah. Right, but, but we, we couldn't put it. put it on there because we needed, we wanted that the access for the valve for no, our they had two. No, I know, but one the, on the, right, the one, one on the side you couldn't put it on because it was hitting the the little piece of copper behind the nut. It's too long and it hits this. It was okay, hidden. But listen to what I said anyhow. I took it off with a little access you raised yeah, into the three quarter yeah. line. Right. I put a straight valve in that so it can't leak out and a cap. That's okay, that's isolated. And right where you say it. The yeah, you said we should have put it on the other side. That's where I put it for you guys. I said, but why? Because it wasn't leaking on the nut. I had checked it. It was not. leaking on the nut. I checked it 10 times the with soap bubbles. It was, leaking on it was not checked. leaking. We checked it with the electronic yeah. detector. And the soap bubbles. Wow. Well, you had it in there when you check it with the electronic deep deep detector. A nitrogen? We had a nitrogen oh, with 404. No, you didn't have 404 in that system. That system had a head pressure of 350 PSIG, a low side pressure of close to zero. It was all vapor no. in there. And no. it was mixed with We and you put that in. Non, non condensed. Because we and you put the 404 in what it. What I did. Oh, listen. Yeah. What I, I said, did. but me and him put 404 in it a little bit. All right. Here's what I did I evacuated, do a leak check, and evacuated, and I charged it up with some uh, uh, MO99. I had it down to negative 10, uh, not negative, I had it down to 10 degrees last night before I shut it down. Oh, thank you. You may need, there may be a leak someplace and it may be in the evaporator <coughs> section, I'm not sure. We checked it with the leak detector. But, um, the evaporator see, the you can turn it on and see if it um, has enough. Okay, we turn yeah. it on now, so maybe it goes into the deep rows by the time we can, we can set it. Well, we'll turn it on. We'll turn the switch on. You see, if it's got a short cycle, it won't do it. Go so turn it on. turn it on. You, need, you may need to put some more refrigerant in it. All right? So... Yeah, because if by the time we turn it on, it's not going to be cool enough to go into the floor. That's what I'm telling you, and I'm going to tell this account that you can, it's okay, you can add some ammo. Uh, mm -hmm. right. There are some things that, you know, technically I'm not supposed to tell you guys that this is a school, but hey, that's why it's real life situation, I'm going to kick your ass in or any ball outside here. So I'm going to tell you what you can do in the field to get out of a situation and still come out smelling like a rose. I mean, like, you right? know, because like you so, said, you keep saying, it's, it's when you get into the real yes. world, you got to do what you got to do, right? So you can use you that. Do what you gotta do, right? So, okay. Now, moisture in a system, the deadliest thing and the most disgusting piece of thing to get is this. Yes. And it's, it's called that happens when you have non-condensed air in the system and air gets into the system. And the way air gets into an operating system is if, um, if you had a leak and you have a defective pressure control or they did not have a low pressure control and the leak is on the low side, yeah, the low side goes into a vacuum, it's going to suck in air. Yeah. And if it's a very humid day, like we've been having, it's going to suck in all of that moisture. What that moisture does, as it circulates with the refrigerant on the high side, all well and dandy. The moment it hits the low side, 
Guess what? I'm a refrigeration system. Minimum temperature is 25 degrees. What is going to happen to the moisture in there? It's going to freeze. And it freezes right at the capillary tube or at the metering device or the fissures. And it forms a block of ice, and that's it. Typically, the system will shut down on some safety. And then, as, a, as the temperature goes up above freezing, the little block of ice or the little thing of ice melts and the system starts working again. And it keeps doing that. And every time the technician goes there, it's working perfectly. Two, two hours after the technician leaves, it craps up again. So it's one of the hardest things to locate. But you will notice one thing. You will, you will have um, high pressures, but not enough refrigerant in that system. Non-condensable is just that. Non condensable is it? You cannot condense it. No, Therefore, what's going to happen? Yeah. If you guys remember Dalton's law, it says that if I have two gases in a cylinder or a container, the total pressure in that container is the pressure of each gas added together. Yeah. So if I have 134A at 175, which is the maximum, let's say, we have that, right? Mm -hmm. Then I have non-condensable. And that, with the heat and everything, let's say we have another 125 here. I'm going to get somewhere in the region of 300 PSI, right? Yeah. That's, that's extra high pressure. And I have an arm capillary tube metering device, yeah, well, guess what my suction side pressure will be? Much. Um, it's well, going to be high, right? Well, it'll be higher than it should be, but as that 300 PSI hits the capillary tube, it's going to drop. Yeah, it's going to drop pressure. here. Yeah. And a regular refrigeration uh, 25 degree coil, compression ratio may be 6 to 1, right? So if my normal operating temperature is um, you guys? No, regular regular region, 35 degree box. Yeah, um, six to degrees. one. No? Let me see. Um, my normal head pressure for one or the four. Let me let me say for this day it's 120 psi g, right? Six of one, that means my low side should be somewhere in the region of um, 20 PSI, right? Now, when I go up to 300, it's still six to one ratio because it's fixed. That's 50 it's be around 50 PSI. PSI. 50 PSI would give me a temperature where like 60 degrees or something like that. Yeah. So that's how the numbers show you what non-condensable does. Bad. So Bad. in that case, what would you do? You'd recover it? Yeah, absolutely. Evacuate yeah. it? Uh, recover it. Recover, recover it. Charging. Back and um, chances are whatever it was, they fixed a leak or something. Because it's not going to hold that kind of pressure if it had a leak. All right. So they probably fixed a leak and then did not evacuate just shoot guys into it. Right? Right? <coughs> right. sure exactly what some guys do. And you're gonna get into you're gonna see this situation. I had this situation a couple of times with ice machine I would charge. When I open it up, you know it's showing hey pressures are high. Yeah. We open it just vapor coming out. No liquid refrigerant. So see how the numbers kind of drive and dance to so it's you can't condense. It's non-condensable. Yeah. So, um, and you see improperly set valves too. That's why I'm telling you, do not touch your TXVs. Leave it be. All right. What time is it? Oh, we have five minutes more. So you said that with that MO99. What's you saying? That's uh, that's somewhat of a substitute for 404. No, no, it's a substitute R2 for R22. But you see, if the system, any system that 
And but we're talking about the one the freezer we got back there. That's four hundred four. Yeah, but it don't work. In it. Yeah, and so, so how it is kind of work. So so it's somewhat of a substitute then, yeah. Yes, it's a substitute for that. Um, you see, the thing is with all these new blends they're coming out with, there's a, a lot of them have the have a single component that's common, and they, their behavior kind of like pretty close to each other. So, so long as we have POE oil in the system, you're safe. It's not going to work 100% because the expansion valve ain't that good. We need a new expansion Yeah, we knew that from the beginning, though. We didn't have That was the nicest one. Well, we had that thing down to temperature. Right? What was it that day, Dan? 18 degrees? Yeah. yeah. But then we had the problem with the capillary. Oh, you know what, guys? Right John, I got a light from here. I'm going to do a quick, very quick, uh, very quick attendance. Hi, everyone's here. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're in the bathroom. In the fourth store. The big one, the handicap store. I'll tell you what. If you're full of crap, you're in the wrong place. Where's Kenny? Where's Kenny? Kenny, I live. I'm going to go with Giovanni just, here. Mr. Teddy, can we grab one of the white boards? There's two of them, man. Mr. Teddy, yeah. Ram Jack. Ram Jack.